Hey, good evening. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Nick. Uh, I'd like to welcome you guys to Shaped by What You Love. Uh, I want to start simply by a bunch of thank yous, because there's a lot of people to thank for making this evening possible. First, the, the sponsors, Sojourn Network, Acts 29 West, Generations Church, uh, Crossway Publishing, The Table, and Cross of Christ Church. All of these uh, people came together to make tonight possible. So thank you guys very, very much. Uh, we also need to thank uh, our great volunteers from Cross of Christ. Thank you guys very much for all manning the beers. Right, everyone? Thank you. Uh, thank you guys for many registration, setting up, tearing down, sound, video, all of that. Thank you guys very much. Do you guys thank the volunteers? And then uh, we also need to thank Dane and Eagle and Pig. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a few notes uh, before we jump in. First, uh, if you haven't had to find them yet, you probably will through the night, or I shouldn't say them, it. There is a bathroom right here. Uh, feel free to come on up during the breaks or even during the speakers if you need to, uh, but they're located right here. Secondly, the beverages are back here uh, to your right. Uh, all we ask is that you please not take any beer out into the parking lot. Um, and for the flow of the evening, you should have received a, um, can you mind, baby? Just a little uh, overview of uh, who the speakers are and some of their background, who the sponsors are, but also if you look here on the inside page up top, you will see uh, the order for the evening. The flow will be, uh, we'll have a speaker, we'll have a 10 minute break, speaker, 10 minute break, speaker, 10 minute break, and at the end we'll have a Q&A. And so you'll notice here, um, there is a hashtag for you on the front page here, uh, hashtag SBWYL. Should have bought a vowel there, right? Um, SBWYL. If you have questions for the speakers uh, based on their topics, we would love to answer them for you in the Q&A. So feel free to tweet that. We will find them in the Twitterverse, and we will ask them during the Q&A. Good? All right. Solid. Thank you. All right. Let me begin. What I would like to do is spend uh, 15 minutes simply laying um, two presuppositions of the whole evening so that the speakers don't need to touch them in their talks, and they can focus on the particulars of how we are shaped by the power of stories, uh, by our views of sex, and by our obsession with health and fitness. <laughs> so two presuppositions for the whole evening. First, uh, that we do what we love. That we do what we love. So even if you are uh, distantly familiar with Christianity, you are aware of the Ten Commandments. Right? Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet. You're probably familiar with those kind of commands. Don't do these bad things. But what you may forget or may not know is that the very first commandment is, is what? Love. Those of you who remember, you should love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. There is, the first command is addressed to our hearts and our desires. The great reformer Martin Luther in his commentary on Galatians said that if we'd only keep that first commandment, we wouldn't actually need, need the other nine. If we loved first, we wouldn't need to be told not to do bad things. Jesus, when asked what the greatest commandment was, summed it up with love God and love your neighbor. We are, as humans, primarily beings that desire and love. We do what we love. And this truth underlies good things that we do for good reasons. It underlies good things that we do for good reasons. Think about acts of genuine kindness and mercy that you show to people in your life. The good things you do for, for good reasons. So I'm not tooting my own horn here. I'm going to use a negative example in a minute. But today, uh, my wife and our neighbor corralled uh, four rambunctious kids into a minivan to take them to the zoo. And on the way, they stopped at our favorite coffee shop. And I know what Kim's favorite uh, little plate to get there, the avocado toast. I know what she likes. So I called ahead to make sure they would prepare it in advance so that when it comes to wrangling kids in a coffee shop, parents, that a fun place to wrangle kids, pretty rough, right? So I made sure it was, it was prepared for her in advance when she got there. Just a good thing I wanted to do because I simply loved my wife and wanted to reduce the stress when she got there. And this truth also underlies the bad things we do for bad reasons, this truth underlies the bad things that we do for bad reasons. What was Breaking Bad but a five-season journey watching Walt love power and money more than his family or anything else? To the extent of even taking on a, an entirely different personality, right? Heisenberg. He loved and he did out of that love. Maybe for you personally, why do you lie? Think about the last time that you lied. Could it be because you love what others think of you more than the truth? or that you love your own comfort more than the discomfort of what telling the truth would bring to you. And lastly, this truth underlies the good things that we do for bad reasons. 
When you do something that appears good, but is ultimately done for your own benefit, you're ultimately giving to yourself. You're loving yourself more than that, uh, that person that you are claiming to serve. Husbands, maybe you're in the same, uh, same boat as me sometimes where I will clean the house in a subtle effort to get a foot rub. Uh, or maybe a little more than that, as my wife likes to call it, chore play. Uh, <laughs> this truth underlies the selfish things, the good things that we do for bad reasons. Humans are primarily beings who desire and love. Before a word comes out of your mouth, before you do anything with your hands, before you post anything to social media, you are loving. The late David Foster Wallace, an agnostic, even uses the word worship to describe what we're talking about tonight. Here's what he says in his commencement speech at Kenyon College. Because here, here's something that's weird but true. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. What he's touching on there is that every one of us pours ourselves out for something, loves something or a person or experiences. We cannot help but give of our desires and affections to something else. There is no detached, entirely objective approach to life. We do what we love. The second presupposition is that we are shaped by those very things that we love. Those of you who are into health and fitness and diet, finish this statement for me. You are what you eat, eat right? So clearly... I eat a lot of asparagus and kale and healthy things, right? I was laughing at myself last week as I was on the couch watching a show about uh, Navy SEAL buds training while popping my wife's cookie dough like it was Pez, <laughs> just pounding through that stuff and just laughing like, yeah, guys, hold your breath for another minute. This is great. <laughs> you, are, you, are sh you are what you eat. You are shaped by what you love. In the Bible, in 2 Kings, the writer of 2 Kings says, they followed worthless idols and they themselves became worthless. Even in the Old Testament, there's this theme through it that touches on the things that we love and give ourselves, the things that we worship end up shaping us in return. One of the most practical ways I've seen this in my life was I worked at a record store that felt a lot like this barbershop for a few years. And it was really funny to watch people come in to the store, dress like they just left a, a Gap outlet, uh, buy an Offspring or a Blink record, and about a year later, they might come in having put egg white in their hair, having Liberty Spikes, buying Crass and Dead Kennedys records. You got to watch this transformation as this, this person was shaped by the things that they loved. Now, don't hear this as a puritanical polemic against desire. Desire in and of itself is not a bad thing. You were made to desire. You were made to desire. And the question is what you desire. And tonight, how that or those objects of your desire shape you in return. So let me close with the rest of David Foster Wallace's quote from that commencement address. Because here's something else that's weird but true. In the day-to-day -day life, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worth worshiping. Everybody worships, and the only choice is what we get to worship. Here's the rest of the quote. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. You will never feel like you have enough. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power, you will end up feeling weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about these forms of worship is that they're unconscious. They are default settings. Friends, we do what we love, and we are shaped by what we love. And our hope tonight is to help you look at some of the ways in our culture how we are shaped by those very things that we love. So let me welcome up our first speaker. Mike Cosper is the founder and director of the Harbor Institute for Faith and Culture, where he works to develop resources for Christians living in a post-Christian world. And prior to that, he served for 16 years as the pastor of worship and arts at Sojourn Community Church, a multi-site church in Louisville, Kentucky. He's the author of Rhythms of Grace, The Stories We Tell, and the forthcoming The Quiet and the Chaos. 
Mike is married to Sarah, and they have two daughters, Dorothy and Maggie. They live in Louisville, Kentucky, and Mike was recently in introduced to Bear Flag Fish Company. Would you guys welcome up Mike Cosper? I have to admit, one of the last things in my life I ever want to do is have to follow David Foster Wallace. <laughs> so that's rough. Um, but no, it's a, it's a privilege to be with you guys. And I, I've known Nick for a little bit and, and some of the other leaders here at the church. And it's great to have the opportunity to be with you all this weekend. Um, to be here in California this is my first time in LA for longer than 24 hours. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Tonight, I'm specifically talking about stories and the way that stories play into this dynamic of being shaped by what we love um, and by the, the twofold dynamic that we, we create these things that somehow then have a power that, that is shaping in our own lives. And I think I'm going to start, um, I'm actually going to start by telling a story. And, and it's, an, it's an odd story. Um, it's an old Scottish uh, uh, folk tale. And, and it was one that I discovered a few years ago. It's, it's, it's a strange story. And we'll just, we'll just start by hearing the story and then try to get into making sense of what the story means and what, what it reveals about stories in general. Um, the story is called The Girl and the Dead Man. And it's a story about a, a mother who had three daughters. And, and these three daughters come of age. And one by one, they go to their mother. And they say, I, I have come of age. It's time for me to go out into the world. So the first one goes to her and, and, and says this, and the mother says, fine, it's time for you to go. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a choice. I can send you with a blessing and a small loaf of bread, or I can send you with a curse and a large loaf of bread. And the oldest daughter uh, hears this and says, you know what, I'll, I'll take the curse because I want the larger piece of bread. So she goes out into the world, and she goes on a journey, and at the end of the day, she finds herself sitting by a, sitting by a wall, and, and she's about to sit down to eat, and a, and a flock of birds lands next to her. And they see that she's about to eat some bread, and the birds say, hey, it, would you share your bread with us? And she says, no, there's barely enough for me. I'm not going you know, to share my bread with you mangy birds. Go away. So the birds fly off. She eats the bread alone. She sleeps poorly. She's cold. Uh, the next morning, she wakes up, and she continues her journey, and she comes to a house. And uh, she knocks on the door of the house, and she says, hey, I'm a, I'm a maiden in the world. I'm, I'm looking for a place to live and a place to work. And then the old woman that answers the door says, great, I'm, I was looking to hire somebody. Uh, my husband is dead, but his dead body is restless. So I need somebody who sits up with him all night long and, uh, and keeps him from running off into the world. So she, she takes the job. She goes and sits down by this dead body to keep watch of him over the night. But because she slept poorly the night before and because she's hungry, she eventually finds herself drifting off into sleep. And the old woman comes into the room and finds her asleep and uh, furious, smacks her over the head with a club and kills her. It's a dark story, OK? <laughs> Second daughter goes to her mother. Uh, oh, and then, then the old lady takes the body and throws it into the trash heap out back. Second daughter comes along and essentially, I told you it was dark. Second daughter comes along. And essentially, the exact same thing happens. She takes the large loaf of bread and the curse. She sets out into the world. The birds ask her to share. She shoes them away. She takes the job. She falls asleep. The old lady smacks her and throws her onto the trash heap. Finally, the youngest daughter goes to her mother. She says, I'm ready to set out into the world. And she says, you know what? I'll take the small loaf and the blessing. And so she goes out into the world, and, and she finds herself kneeling by this wall towards the end of the day. And this flock of birds lands, and they say, hey, will you share your bread with us? And she says, yes, I'll share my bread with you. What I have is yours. She shares the bread. And then the flock of birds ends up flocking around her and covering her, covering her with their wings. And she sleeps peacefully through the night. The next day, she continues on her way. She comes to the house. The old lady offers her the job. And, uh, and she takes the job. And so that night, she, uh, she's sitting. She's knitting. And the old man wakes up. And when the old man wakes up, she grabs a club. And she says, you lay down, or I'm going to smack you with this club. <laughs> and then uh, he lays back down. Second time, she does it again. She warns him again. She says, lay down, or I'm going to smack you with the club. Third time, the old man sits up again. And this time, she just whacks him with the club. And all of a sudden, the club is stuck to the old man, and it's stuck to her hand. And he takes off running. And the folk tale says that they run through the woods. And when it was high for him, it was high for her. And when it was low for him, it was low for her. And I have no idea what that means, OK? <laughs> Just part of the story. So they run through the woods, and they find themselves back at the house. And all of a sudden, the, the, the old man is dead again. 
and her, and her hands are free, and the old woman comes in and, and sees what happened, and that she stayed awake, and that she guarded the body, and she not only pays the, the girl what she owed her for her wages, um, but she also gives her a gift. She gives her a, a cordial of a magic, uh, magic liquid. And so the, the, she sends her on her way, and as she leaves, she goes out back, and she sees her sisters lying dead on the trash heap, and she pours the cordial over her dead sisters and brings them back to life, and they go on their way. The end of the story. So, like I said, strange story, right? Uh, Disney has yet to make that one into a cartoon. <laughs> but I, I love this story because it, it, shows, it shows me in so many ways, it, it, it reveals so much about the world. Um, what, what's happening in this story is you have somebody who's given this choice of, of blessings or bread, of a spiritual gift or a physical gift. And, and what the story is warning us about is it's warning us about looking at the world in such a way that all we care about is the physical, is, is the material. It tells us that there's something to this idea of being blessed. There's something to this idea of generosity. The younger daughter uh, seeks to, to possess less but finds herself having more. And, and folk tales like this are incredibly common. If you start to look at sort of the history of folk tales, they're just loaded with morality and they're loaded with a vision for how does the world work. And, and most of us know this experience. If you, if you cling to something, you often lose it. If you try to grab a hold of possessions, th this quote that, uh, that Nick just quoted from David Foster Wallace is a perfect example of it. These things that we, we cling to, whether it's beauty or wealth or power or, 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 or uh, intelligence, whatever it might be, we cling to these things and we lose them. And so to me, it's a perfect, it's a perfect example of the way that stories carry meaning. And stories carry this ability to frame the world. They, they tell us what the world is like, and they tell us, they invite us to a way of participation in the world. But there's a second reason that I do this, because, uh, because I wanted to, to demonstrate the, the other thing that stories have this power to do. When somebody's standing in front of you, whether you're at a dinner table or at an event like this, and they start to tell a story, some very, uh, very interesting things start to happen in your brain. Certain parts of your brain, some of the, the sort of rational processing parts of your brain actually begin to dim a little bit. And the visual parts of your brain begin to light up and the affective parts of your brain begin to light up in really unique ways. There's a, there's a psychology to storytelling that's something that, that scientists don't fully understand how it works or why it works. But when someone tells you a story, for, for the first maybe minute or so, you might be sort of rationally carrying along and asking why on earth is he telling this ridiculous Scottish folktale. But then if the storyteller is halfway decent, hopefully halfway decent, you're, you're carried away. You're carried into the story. Your emotions are tied to the story. There's a great book by a guy named Jonathan Gottschall. It's called The Storytelling Animal. And, and Gottschall is, is a writer, and he's fascinated by the way stories work. And, and he began to sort of look into some of this, this research and what happens in the brain when somebody tells a story. And he also began to look into uh, why stories exist. And, and he, he writes from a secular perspective, and he's essentially trying to figure out why on earth would this animal, this ape, uh, evolve the ability to tell stories? And what is it that, that's captivating and powerful about storytelling? And he really comes down to about two or three different theories as to how storytelling evolved in human beings. The first is that it, it, it's a capacity that we evolved so that we would know where food is, right? So you go out on a journey one day and you wander away from your cave and you, you, climb, a, you climb a cliff and you go down into a valley and you find that there's berries growing and there's fish in the river. And so you go back to your cave, and the ability to tell the story was one of the ways that you could pass on this wisdom to the, to the next generation. Uh, another theory that Gottschall explores is the idea that storytelling is kind of like the feathers on a peacock. It's a way of attracting a mate. If you can tell a good story, maybe you can lure a woman back to your cave with you. The third one is, uh, again, sort of this wisdom idea, this idea of being able to pass wisdom down to the next generation and preserve the species. So you go on a similar journey, and you, you walk into a cave, and you find a tiger. Uh, you can go back to your tribe, and you can say, hey, don't go into that cave. There's a tiger in that cave. But Gottschall, after he, after he does all this research and after he looks at these different theories, he acknowledges at the end of the book that none of these, none of these stories, none of these theories are terribly compelling. The storytelling really re remains sort of a human mystery. 
Um, it's a, it's a, something wholly unique to us as human beings. And, and he, he admits that these accounts just don't add up. They don't provide a compelling reason for why we might be this way. And so I think from, from our perspective as believers, as people who know that we were created by a God and created with intention and with purpose, we might begin to look at this as, uh, as a question of design. Why were we designed to be story receptors? Why are we designed in such a way that when somebody starts to tell a story, we suddenly get carried away and carried along with them into that story? And I believe that that design's intentional in that it's a way in which we are able to connect with and commune with our covenant God, who is telling a story, whose scriptures are rich with story, and whose, whose good news, whose gospel is a story that comes to us. But for a world that's been separated from God, from a, for a world that's in search of God, uh, we find ourselves searching for meaning in the stories that we tell all the time. Again, I think the, the girl and the dead man is a perfect example of this. It's a, it's a meaning-making story. It's a story that comes because somebody looks at the world and, and looks at the way generosity works, and, and there's not a material explanation for it. There's not a material explanation for the reality that when you grasp something, it seems to slip away from you. And when you're generous, you seem to have abundance. And so a story can come along and present that and pass that wisdom along to other people. But I think there's other ways that we're looking for meaning when we tell stories. And, and I like to tie this into this idea that, that God is a storytelling God. And one thing we talk about in, in, in the Christian tradition, we talk about how the, the, the story of the scriptures is a story that encompasses the whole history of humanity. And it's divided in these movements of creation and fall and redemption and consummation. Consummation being the time that we believe is coming when Christ returns and when all things are made new. And so, so what I think is interesting is that it, if you begin to look at human storytelling, if you begin to look at the, the things we're saying, whether it's in movies or in novels or in, in television shows, you begin to find that people are asking questions related to these themes all of the time. For instance, I think when we talk about creation and fall, we're talking about, hey, how did, we, how did we come to be and what went wrong with the world? What is wrong with this place that we live in? And so two movies that immediately popped into my mind when I think about that question are Dances with Wolves and Avatar. And that's partially because they're kind of the same movie, right? And, and what you have in these movies is you have, you have a story of sort of a perfect world, you know, a pristine world, a world where there are people who live in kind of a perfect harmony with the creation around them. And then some element comes from the outside. Uh, some element comes from the outside and they bring technology and they bring power and they bring a lust for consumption and they destroy this beautiful, perfect world. Another story that gets told oftentimes trying to, to make sense of the world is a variation on the, on the myth of Prometheus. Uh, Prometheus in Greek mythology was the one who went and stole fire from the gods. And, and with it, he empowered humanity, but he also unleashed evil and death and, onto humanity. When Mary Shelley originally wrote uh, her novel about Dr. Frankenstein, the, the subtitle of the novel was The Modern Prometheus. This idea of someone stealing power from God, creating life, something that human beings shouldn't be capable of doing, but with, with, with technology and with literally with black magic, he, cre he creates life, and that life unleashes hell on earth. Another uh, even more contemporary example is actually in the, the stories of Spider-Man. And Grant Morrison, in, in his book, uh, Super Gods, has this, this great description of, of how Spider-Man comes to be, of how Spider-Man evolved into, into 20th century society. He says, you can't separate Spider-Man from the, the fear of the atomic bomb. You can't see them separate from one another. Because what you have in the Spider-Man stories are you have these villains who are, are working with technology and trying to create something good, whether it's uh, a, new, a new medical technology or a new power technology or a super soldier that's gonna bring peace on Earth. And they, they mess with technology and the technology corrupts them. And all of a sudden you have Dr. Octopus or the, the Green Goblin or uh, the Lizard or whoever it might be. And so human interventions create this evil. But then there's sort of this providential thing that happens where a radioactive spider bites a nerd and suddenly he becomes Spider-Man. And so where, where human in, in effort and endeavor bring, bring terror to the world, some kind of providential act brings good, brings peace. And Grant Morrison says you can't think about this story without the, the shadow of the atom bomb, the shadow of nuclear war and of all the, the terrible things that would be unleashed if that ever happened. I think we tell stories at times 
uh, trying to understand why do we make bad decisions? Why do we do things like Paul asks in Romans 7? Why do we do the things that we hate we do? Uh, Nick mentioned Breaking Bad already. I'll, I'll bring one more to it, which is Mad Men. Mad Men's the story of this guy who, who Don Draper seems to have a heart and he, he seems to want to, to come home and to, to have peace and to have relationships with his kids and to, to genuinely want love and to genuinely want re- friendships and, and, and meaning. And yet again and again and again, Don is his own worst enemy. He self-sabotages. I think it's a way of asking what's, what's gone wrong with the world and, and how we see ourselves in it. We're also asking all the time, what's going to save us? Where is redemption going to come from? And, and two examples I'll, I'll mention briefly are, are what's, what's often called the hero's journey. If you took a, uh, a lot of storytelling c- kind of classes in college, you might have encountered jo- Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell developed this idea really extensively. But the hero's journey is, a, is sort of a theme that you see in movies that include Star Wars and many superhero films. Um, where a, a, a character sort of from a, from a faraway place has to go on this long journey away from home in order to discover who he is and what his power and what his strength is and how he can, how he can conquer evil and, and redeem all things. And it's a story that beautifully parallels the gospel where Jesus goes from a, a place of ultimate glory and he humbles himself and he humbles himself to, uh, far enough to go to death on a cross in order to redeem mankind. Another version of the hero's journey is sort of an inversion of it, where the the character through whom redemption comes is somebody that you you don't expect. Somebody like Frodo Baggins, a a hobbit. No one would ever notice a hobbit. No one would ever think a hobbit was going to be a a powerful hero. Or a uh, slightly more oddball example of it would be the dude in Big Lebowski. The dude is this character who who steps into this absurd situation and literally everything that goes wrong, every sin in that movie ends up punishing not the people who commit them, but the dude. The dude's the one that suffers. He suffers all the way through the movie. He's like a suffering servant. And I love at the end of the movie the the speech that's that's, that's being made by the narrator where he says, you know, I'm glad he's out there. I'm glad he's out there suffering for all us sinners, right? We have this sense that we need something to save us, that something needs to redeem us from the broken state of the world that we're in. Quentin Tarantino's movies are obsessed with this idea, and for Tarantino, he ties it into violence. For Tarantino, the only way the world's going to get saved, the only way things are going to get made right, is that there has to be bloodshed. And again, I think these things arise from from a heart that longs for God, that longs for redemption, and is looking for an opportunity to to cling to hope. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God's put eternity on men's hearts. We have this longing for him, and we're looking for him. And the stories that we tell in this effort to make sense of the world are are framing the world in a way that, that, that tries to make sense of the violence, that tries to make sense of the brokenness and the loss. One last theme we'll explore is this idea of, of, of how's it all going to end? This idea of what, what, what theologians would call consummation, the ultimate ending of things. How are, how are things going to end? How are they going to resolve? And you know, it's interesting, in, in kind of the modern era, the last few hundred years, uh, you don't see a whole lot of, of, of stories that promise us a happy ever, ender, ha- happy ever after ending. Uh, most of the fairy tales that sort of end with happy ever after are much older than, than the modern era. Now, you see philosophers, people like Karl Marx and and Friedrich Hegel, who are saying that that history is on this march towards transcendence, and we're going to come to sort of a utopian thing. So you see a number of philosophers say that, but but most of the artists of the last couple hundred years, especially the last 150, most of the artists are telling us that things are going to end badly. Things are going terribly. They write books like Brave New World or The Hunger Games or The Road. We, we're afraid for where we're going. We're afraid of what's happening to the world around us. Like the girl and the dead man, these are all efforts to make sense of the world and to make sense of why things are the way that they are. One other reason that we tell stories is that we're, we're, we're trying to paint a picture of what the good life is. And this, this really brings us back to this idea of shaped by what we love. We We are shaped by these stories, but we are also shaping these stories. And the things that we think are going to make us happy, 
We love telling stories about that. We love hearing those stories and passing those stories on. So for instance, my, my friend Martin Bond, he, uh, he, he talks about the, the gospel according to chick flicks. And, and in this he says, you know, basically every romantic comedy has the exact same plot. And it's a gospel plot. And it's a vision that says, you know what, if you can find true love, if you can get with the one true love, the person that you're, you're really meant to be with forever and ever, then you're going to be happy. And, and you know, there, there's three categories I want to point out that, that I think flesh this out. Because oftentimes these stories that we're telling that, that are sort of invitations to the good life, they're not giving us real great answers. The first one we'll talk about is, is possession porn, okay? And the best example of this is, is in advertising. Uh, my favorite ad for the last couple of years was this Ford truck ad that came out about maybe a year, year and a half ago. And it's, it's this, beautifully shot, uh, this beautifully shot commercial. There's a real subtle soundtrack. And there's, the, there's a guy in a truck with a trailer, and he's got three friends with him, and they're driving through the desert. And, and the narrator has this like classic Marlboro man voice, and he says, a man, a man and a truck and some company. And he basically tells this story, and he goes out to the desert, and you see these guys, and they're, dri they're, they're driving dirt bikes, and they're jumping over sand dunes, and he talks about how you know, they're, they're you know, a few adventures and a few sore vertebrae and a couple of hard landings and a long ride home that's gonna make it all melt away. And what's amazing is he literally says nothing about the truck. Nothing. Because the ad's not about the truck. The ad's about the vision of the good life that if we possess this truck, we'll have. If you buy this truck, you're going to be satisfied. You're going to have the community you want. You're going to have the masculine identity that you want. You're going to have the adventures that you want. And we do this over and over and over again. This is how ads work. This is why Axe Body Spray is a thing, right? <laughs> right? They're not selling you, hey, you're going to smell great when you buy this product, because nobody believes that that stuff smells great. <laughs> They're selling you that, that you can get what you want. You can be desirable. Right? We want to be wanted. We want to be desirable. And if you buy this thing, it's going to make you irresistible to women. And, and the same thing works, interestingly, the same thing works for a Victoria's Secret ad. They're selling the same thing. They're both objectifying women, and they're saying, if you buy this, you'll be wanted. You'll be desirable. So that's possession porn. It offers us this, this promise of buy this, buy that, and you're going to get what you want. The second one we'll talk about is, is fame porn. And frankly, there's, there's no better person to point at for fame porn than good old Kim Kardashian, right? Because we tell tons of stories about Kim, and anything she does is front page news, and she has multiple reality television shows, and she has real pornography, but I don't even want to deal with that, right? What, why are we obsessed with her? Why are we obsessed with her? She gave an interview to The Guardian a few years ago where the, the, the reporter for The Guardian was kind of drilling her on, on tell, me why, tell me why you're famous. Tell me why people care about what you do. And he says to her, what's your talent? And, she, and it, he says that she, he, she looked at him with eyes as wide as a bush baby's and said, well, a bear can be taught to juggle and ride a tricycle, and he's talented. You know what I mean? Basically saying talent doesn't matter. I'm famous. And I think the reason why she's on the cover of all of these magazines and the reason why people tune into her show is, again, not because anybody thinks she's talented, but because she has a glory that we think would make us happy. She has money, she has power, she has sexuality, she has, a f she has fame, she has f uh, millions of adoring fans. And we think if we had that, then we'd be happy. It's a vision of the good life, and it's stories that we tell like that that, that, that shape what we love and are shaped by what we love. The last one I'll, I'll, I'll uh, mention is what I call home porn. Uh, and, and HGTV is obviously home for this. <laughs> we tell these stories, and, and again, it's this idea of if, if we do these things, if we have these things, it'll make us happy. I think the best example of it of all, the most blatant example of it, is the show Extreme Home Makeover, which is no longer on the air because most people who, went, who were guests on that show had to sell their house because they couldn't pay the taxes on them. The, the after stories of that show are horrific. But the end of each episode was incredibly revealing 
because they'd send this couple away, they'd send this family away, they'd, they'd remake their home, and then everyone would stand in front of the house and the crowds are chanting and everybody's excited and there's a bus blocking their view, right? And how does the show end? What do they yell? That's right, you've seen the show. They move that bus and the bus drives out of the way and the reaction says everything. The reaction is people falling to their knees, their hands in the air, and they're crying, and they're shouting. Now what is that? It's worship. It's worship. It's this idea of this is what my heart has longed for, and now I have it. Now I have what I want. And again, the after story matters, because the after story reminds us that it's, it's not satisfying. It doesn't work. It doesn't add up. Now, I think it's no wonder that God has primarily been revealing himself in stories. Because we're primed for this. We're wired for this. And so we have a God who, when he reveals himself, he reveals himself in his scriptures. He reveals himself as a God who tells stories. 60, uh, roughly 65% of the Bible is a narrative about the things that God has done in faithfulness to his people over the years, the ways he has continually pursued and pursued and pursued in spite of the fact that we have run and run and run. One of the most telling moments, I think, in all of the Bible is in the book of Exodus, where after Moses, uh, after Moses leads the, the people of Israel out of slavery and, and into the desert, and, and Pharaoh's pursuing them, they, they cross the Red Sea, and God opens the Red Sea, they cross it, and as soon as they get to the other side, the Lord crushes Pharaoh's armies in a flood of water, and they're set free. They know they're free. They're liberated once and for all. And amazingly, right at that moment is the moment that they stop and Moses tells them the story, right? He sings, he sings a song to them. And he, he essentially equips them with a story that says, this, this is what God just did. And it's a story that they're supposed to tell over and over and over again. And the Passover meal, the Passover ritual, is ultimately a set of symbols that's meant to remind them of what God has done. It's their high, holy thing. Their high, holy service is an opportunity to remember the story and to tell it again and again. In the life of Jesus, whenever Jesus is in, is, is in the midst of debate, when, when, when someone comes to challenge him with a theological question, his answer most of the time is to respond by telling a story, by telling a parable, by saying once there was a, a guy who found treasure in a field, and he was so excited about what he found, he went back and he sold everything he had so he could buy that field and possess that treasure. Somehow he, he knows that by giving them stories, He's going to be able to haunt them way more than he's going to haunt them with propositions. The gospel itself, this thing that, that, that unites the church and draws us together, is, before it's anything else, a story. It's a story about a God who made the world, about mankind who, who broke it through our sin and rebellion, and about Jesus Christ who, who descended, condescended to become a human being, to suffer the, the death on the cross, and then to rise on the third day and to send his Holy Spirit to, to make us into a new people who now live on mission with him and for him. And, and the two symbols, the two most important symbols that he gives the church afterwards are symbols ultimately that, that remind us of the story. Our baptism is a reminder that you are dead in Christ and you've raised again. And, and it's a symbol that we're meant to see our stories in. Every time we see someone baptized, we're able to see how we were once sinners who've been washed in the blood and the mercy of Jesus Christ. And then the Lord's Supper, it's a, it's a story that, that he gives us. And, and I love when, 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 uh, when Paul is asked how, how this thing is supposed to go, he says, I'm going to pass it on to you exactly the way that it was passed on to me. On the night he was betrayed, what is he doing? He's telling the story again. This is your story. This is who you are as a people. This is who God has made you to be. See, I think the, the, the heart of the Christian life is learning how to retell that story to ourselves again and again and again. It's the reason the church is commanded to continue to gather. We're, we gather to remember the story and to, to see ourselves in it afresh and anew, to frame our world inside the story, to know that, that this is actually how the world works. And this is a story that, that can give us the satisfaction that we're longing to. The goal is to find ourselves in this. And it's the ultimate counter story. Because the gospel offers us a, a far better possession 
particularly in our day and age that's so consumeristic, so possession, so possession obsessed. And it offers us a far better glory. It offers us the glory of redemption. It offers us a, a hiddenness in Christ, which means that, that I don't have to live a life on constant display. Because why? I'm, I'm hidden with Christ in God. And it promises, promises us a glory that one day will be revealed when Christ returns. And it's, it's a life that's always lived in the midst of this tale. Always lived remembering what God has done and remembering what he promises. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs>